Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today I'm going to be doing something that I've been doing quite a bit of lately, and that is another book review. Um, I've been reading a lot, I've been listening to a lot of audiobooks as well, and uh, it seems like it's something that a lot of you enjoy, so I'm going to keep on doing it in addition to you know regular ga gameplay videos. Now the footage you see in the background is from Order of Battle Pacific, which I still have like two hours of footage just kind of laying around. And frankly, I didn't have a lot of time to go and create new footage today. Additionally, um, you know, the topic that this book covers is kind of the Cold War slash World War III. And while I would love to have some modern tank combat games, um, I don't right now. Nothing that's not arcadey anyway. I would love to be good at Steel Beast Pro, but I'm not going to go out and spend $100 on, on that game when I don't own it already um, just for one video. Uh, and it's, it's the kind of game that I think uh, takes a lot more time and effort to learn than I have right now. So I'm just going to stick with what I have. Um, the book that I'm looking at today is called uh, Team Yankee. It is a World War III slash Cold War classic when it comes to uh, novels about hypothetical Third World Wars. The book Team Yankee is written by Harold Coyle, and it recently became available on Audible, which is actually how I listen to it. Now, the interesting thing about Team Yankee is while I have some issues with the plot and the overarching story and the way that the war kind of comes about, uh, the plot itself, the overarching theme, was not created by Harold Coyle. In fact, he used the Third World War scenario that was laid out in the book The Third World War, The Untold Story, uh, by General Sir John Hackett. Uh, the book was written in 1982 about hypothetical Third World War that was fought in 1985, and kind of the 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 flow and direction and the way that the war uh, unravels in the book is actually in in the book Team Yankee actually comes entirely from uh, the Third World War by John Hackett, who I actually recently just purchased that book. And we'll probably read it. I don't know if I'll review it or not, but it might make sense because these two books are so closely linked. So I find that really interesting. Um, but it also uh, leads to some weaknesses, I think, in Team Yankee itself. Now, Team Yankee is a book that really focuses on company-level tank combat. Uh, whereas the Third World War focused more at the strategic and political level, uh, Harold Coyle has decided to uh, focus on... Uh, tank combat in this third world war. So the book follows a company t or a, a company of tanks uh, called Team Yankee uh, in this third world war. Uh, they're based in kind of central Germany when the war breaks out. It starts as some sort of conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union that brews out of a crisis in the Middle East. It's, it's somewhat vague as far as the exact details, but somehow that boils into a crisis uh, that, that results in the Soviet Union invading Germany. And then the book really focuses on following Team Yankee throughout. Uh, now... It starts with an initial defense against the first Russian assaults against them, and then you find out that the attack is going really well in the north, uh, but not so much in the south and center of Germany. Uh, the Russians quickly overwhelm the Allies in the north. They drive all the way west to the border of Germany. They cut off Denmark, and they uh, I don't, I'm not clear on if they actually invade uh, Holland and, and the Netherlands or if they just get that far. Uh, at that point... Uh, the attack begins losing steam. But one one key issue I have uh, with this book is that it really portrays the Soviets out to be these uh, completely blundering imbeciles, you know, with with absolutely no sense. So it, it makes it makes the Soviets sort of into the traditional boogeyman of they're either absolutely you know diabolically evil, or uh, they are just flat out incompetent. Every single time that Team Yankee ends up in combat with the Soviets, they do something stupid or something lucky happens for Team Yankee. It just doesn't feel compelling. The combat doesn't feel compelling because it never really feels like anything is at risk. And again, some of this is dictated by the direction that the Third World War goes as far as you know, Team Yankee needing to meet with success in some of these engagements. But I think that uh, Harold Coyle could have done a better job in kind of making these combats feel effective. You know, the only time in the book 
where it felt, you know, like, holy crap, this is serious shit, and this, you know, this team is getting the crap beat out of it, and this is this really feels like World War World War Three is a night attack where the team goes from something like ten tanks to four tanks, and then they barely hang on to this, you know, this hill in the middle of the night. Spoiler alert. And then later, after the fact, you find out that, oh, just kidding, only two tanks were lost. There's still eight of the ten tanks that are fine, and nobody really got hurt from, you know, there were a couple, you know, minor characters who got hurt. But overall, it just, it kind of felt like, well, crap, that was not difficult at all. And and while I appreciate that from a Fog of War standpoint, that's actually a neat way to tell a story to be like, yeah, you know, you thought this happened, but actually they were just kind of disabled or they were, you know, they were lost in the night or, or what have you. Um, I also think the book does a really good job of kind of detailing the difficulty of moving, co- you know, moving tanks in, in combat environments. It tells a sort of firsthand account of, you know, all these different units moving around and, you know, how they get lost and how people respond to combat. Um, and that's compelling. Uh, but another piece of the book that was somewhat frustrating was that at the beginning of the book, it, it kind of tries to, to tell the story of this company commander and his family and kind of their, you know, being evacuated out of Europe because of the coming war and some, some stuff that happens there. But then it just drops that plot line. It, it spends a reasonable amount of time talking about his wife and his family and their struggle to get out. And then when they, when they do escape, you know, maybe a third of the way into the book, you never hear about him again. You know, he gets a letter from his wife at some later point, but it's almost like we're going to we're going to introduce these characters, we're going to talk about them, we're going to say they go through a bunch of stuff, we're going to say they're struggling, and yeah, now you're never going to hear from him again. Okay, um that's fine, I guess, but it seems it seems like well, what was the point in even including any of that? I, I just don't understand. I mean, if you want to tell a story from a first-person tanker standpoint, do that. And don't give us an insight into what's going on with his family. You know, that doesn't make it fine. But if you're going to give us insight into what's happening to his family and try and make us invested in the characters, then don't talk a lot about them for a third of the book and then never mention them again. Again, it was just seemed, it felt like a weird, weird decision from me you know, plot and character development standpoint. Um, in addition to that, another frustration I had um, was that uh, while the combat wasn't terribly compelling, it was, it, and when I say it wasn't compelling, it was very well written. It was very well done. Um, I think they he created some interesting characters. Uh, I think the way that the characters responded to combat uh, was also interesting. Um, I think... The combat was almost written as if Team Yankee was written after the Gulf War, where the Soviets could do nothing against the American armor, and the American armor just ran through them like knives through butter, um, which was interesting because this was written in 87. Uh, the Team Yankee was was written in 87. Um, so that bit, I guess, is kind of, kind of interesting. Um, an annoyance I have is that the war lasts 14 days, um, the fact that, uh, World War III could last two weeks and be over in two weeks in the way that it's portrayed in this book, uh, seems a little bit unlikely. I also think kind of going back to the Soviet critiques, you know, he, he, he shows examples of Soviets fragging their own officers, you know, being unmotivated to fight KGB people, killing people just for the sake of killing people and in general ineptitude, um, which is Fine to some extent. I mean, we certainly have that played up quite a bit as far as the, you know, the, the political officer handicapping Soviet forces. But it just didn't seem, you know, it almost seemed like, okay, you're saying that they're they're evil. You're saying that they're incompetent and that they, you know, they're just, you know, un- completely un- non-functional. And yet the plot relies around them driving all the way to the border with the Netherlands in the north. And then, you know, these guys are fighting kind of in the south. It doesn't seem to mesh well. Like they, they, they shouldn't be a coherent combat force if it's really this group of disheveled, you know, officer killing, um, you know, KGB, you know, mass executing soldiers. I guess the, the from the Soviet perspective, it just didn't seem 
very plausible. And I think uh, it, it could have been done better if rather not even giving us any insight into what was going on with the Soviets. Again, just make it a first person. Don't give us these little insights. Because what happens with this book is it's really told from a first person perspective from a couple of characters on the American side, really focusing on a single American captain with a few ancillary characters from a first person perspective in World War III. Fine. That's a really cool and neat concept. But then every once in a while, the author will be like, and now you're looking at it from the point of view of a Soviet hind attack helicopter pilot, and 30 seconds later, the end. Uh, you're never going to hear from that guy again. So just these weird little snippets you know, into these other characters, I think, again, focusing on strictly making it a first-person narrative would have been better. And I know I'm coming to this book 30 years on, uh, but it's still, you know, reading it was kind of like, oh, that's a little bit odd. Um, another bit to that, as I just mentioned the hind, the book completely ignores the air war, which I don't understand how you do. Um, it talks a little bit about American strikes, deep strikes, attacks on bridges and support preparatory to an attack. Fine. That's fine. That, you know, you don't need to include these snippets that I'm talking about. Like I'm not saying put me in the, the seat of an F-15 as it's flying around Europe, but it didn't seem... It seemed completely divorced from the way a third world war would be. And what I mean by that is in the very first scene after the war breaks out, they know it breaks out because they see two Soviet jets fly over their tank column. Okay, great. That's a great way to introduce it, to say, holy shit, they're flying over our territory. Oh my goodness, we're getting word on the, on the radio that the war started, the Russians are attacking. Great. You don't see another single fixed-wing aircraft until like 10 days into the war. And then it's an American A-10. And it's in there for like 10 seconds. And then it's gone. I, I don't believe that. I don't I don't believe that an American tank battalion, this expands scope a little bit beyond just the company. It focuses on the company, but it really looks at the whole tank battalion. I don't believe in an American infantry, mechanized infantry tank battalion would operate 10 days in a World War III environment without calling any close air support. Artillery's all over the place, sure, but there's no close air support. There's no examples of them fighting the Soviets, you know, tank battles going on, and planes flying in around and bombing things, and the Soviets maybe flying in and bombing things. I mean, I guess you can make the argument that the Americans get air superiority in the way that they do in Red Storm Rising, but even there, the air war is a huge part, and ground forces are constantly seeing aircraft flying over them. Meanwhile, the Americans are advancing deep into Germany at one point, you know, driving mile and mile and mile after mile, engaging in tank battles, and there's no aircraft. They show helicopters once, they show fixed-wing aircraft once, and there's no... It, it, I, I don't understand how you can do that. I mean, it's not the Third World War in the 1980s if you're a tanker and you're rolling across the plains in Germany and there's no aircraft. Like, to me, that would be a key thing to focus on is this tanker's ability to fight in an incredibly hostile environment with planes flying left and right, you know, things being shot down, you know, these distractions, these challenges, and instead it just turns into SSN of the tank world. And what I mean by that is if you've ever read Tom Clancy's SSN, it's an interesting book that focuses on you know, the technology and capabilities of the American Los Angeles attack submarine, but it's basically a video game. Because the sub just sails from point to point, sinking a whole bunch of enemy ships, never really being in danger, never really being challenged. And it's just going from point to point where it's like, and now this happens. So then we launch our torpedoes and sink eight enemy submarines all by ourselves. And then we go to a tender and we get new torpedoes. And now we just sink 30 enemy subs with no danger to ourselves. And then, at the very end, we obliterate the Chinese high command, destroy five more Chinese submarines. Oh, and one of our friends over there dies, but we're fine because our sub never had a challenge in the world. There needs to be conflict in this book for it to be a successful and compelling read. There needs to be the sense that the Soviets are a competent enemy. There needs to be the sense that something bad could happen. And when you go through this entire book and nothing bad happens with a few really ancillary bits, 
it's it's frustrating because so much of the book is well done. I mean, I'm being a little bit overly critical here because I do think the book is is very well written. I think it describes tank combat in a, in a compelling and an effective way. It makes you feel like you're there. It makes you feel like this is really happening, but there's just some key components that are missing to really make you feel engaged. And um, I don't think tying it so closely uh, to hack its third world war scenario was was ideal because you just have the Soviet Union comes apart too quickly um, and and the United States, the forces you see engaged are never really they're not they're not challenged. They lose like three, four tanks in the entire war in two weeks of like three dozen battles. I, anyway, um, I think those are my main my main concerns with the book was just one the the air battle stuff just is the lack of of air combat and and dealing with that um, <laughs> that that's almost laughably uh, uh, bad as if it's like you know oh no 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 <laughs> that makes it too complicated to write about and then explain how these guys survive. Um, it doesn't really give a justification of anything. It doesn't say like, oh, there's a cap up and it's protecting us or something. You know, there's nothing. It's just artillery and tanks. Yay. Um, the Russians are unbelievably stupid most of the time. Anytime anything happens, it's always bad luck for the Russians and good luck for the Americans. Uh, there's one scene where you think maybe bad things happen and then they don't. I still think that was okay and it was compellingly written, but then you've got to have something else where like there's actually a challenge and a crisis that happens. And the closest they come to that is when like one of their sister companies gets kind of chewed up a bit and then they come to the rescue, but but it it's never really it never really feels like there's a, they're they're at risk. You never feel like you're on the edge of your seat of, "Oh my god, something bad might happen." Um, "Oh my god, you know, this could turn on them." It's just uh, it's a it's a Persian golf esque, you know, just steamrolling of the enemy without any real, um, any real challenge, and then all of a sudden the war is over because the Soviet Union falls apart. Um, and I know that bits out, that bits outside of you know the author's book uh, control in this case because he relies on another author's sort of political thriller, if you will. In my mind, the best third world war book that's out there that i've read and i haven't run a lot of them is still red storm rising um and because it really addresses a lot of the critiques i have of team yankee uh it explains you know american technological superiority and how these tanks you know are outperforming their soviet compa you know compatriots however still certainly has huge casualties deals with logistical constraints, which this book really doesn't deal with. This book just it kind of alludes to like, oh, well, our, you know, our staging areas are all out of, are all out of tanks, so resources are a problem, but, it, you know, like supplies always get to the front. That's another area the book could have, you know, could have added as a challenge. Like maybe they could have, you know, not had sufficient fuel come to the front, or maybe they could have been running low on ammunition or something, all issues which Red Storm Rising touches on. The Soviet Un Union is just this uh, army of incompetent and, um, you know, Neanderthals, which, again, I get it's kind of it's a product of its time, right? The book came out in the 1980s, and, and you know, certainly the Soviet Union was the evil empire at the time. But on the flip side, you know, Red Storm Rising came out in the 1980s, and I think, uh, you know, Tom Clancy did a better job of painting a more nuanced picture of the Soviets um, in sort of a... Yeah, they have their issues with the KGB making things inefficient, but they also have, you know, some highly competent and capable uh, soldiers. Um, I think just ignoring the Soviets altogether would have been a better approach and literally just make it first person uh, rather than, you know, continuing to jump into these characters for 20 minutes so you could show what an idiot they were. Um, I think the fact that luck always sides with, with Team Yankee is mildly annoying and, and not terribly plausible either. Um yeah, I mean, as far as uh, the book's concerned, it's it's interesting. Um, I I just think it's interesting and it's well written. And if you really want to kind of feel like you know you you want a book that describes a hypothetical tank combat, this isn't a bad one to look at from a company company perspective. 
but it's it's not a great one. And uh, it's lack of air power, it's desire to just completely abandon characters that it spends a substantial time building up and then just drops them off the face of the earth, most notably with regards to the family. Um, it's uh, complete reliance on the Third World War uh, by Sir John Hackett for the overarching theme of how the war goes, the implausible end to the war after just two weeks. Um, all of that are, are serious weaknesses which hinders the enjoyment, and I don't think the book ages very well because of, because of some of those. Um, I don't believe it from a lack of air combat, from a combat experience type book, uh, but the tank on tank stuff is good. Uh, some of the emotional stuff, some of the characters, you know, are developed into compelling characters. Um, and it's worth a read. Uh, I did throw a link in the description if that's something you're interested in. It is an affiliate link. Um, but I think there probably are better routes to go. I know it seems to be kind of a classic within most people I talk to, but, um, uh, it's, it was good for a one read. I don't think I'll ever revisit it. Um, but anyway, guys. That's going to about do it for me here today. Uh, I really, this felt, in retrospect, this feels like it's a lot more of a hit piece on Team Yankee than it was intended to be. Um, I still enjoyed my time with the book. Uh, there were just some pieces where I was like, yeah, well, that wouldn't happen, or yeah, that's not very realistic, or well, what about the frickin' Air Force, or, you know, things like that. So nothing glaringly atrocious, just seemingly incomplete and half-hearted, almost like the book was rushed out, uh, and pieces were left or not fully polished or fully developed. Um, but all in all, still a, an enjoyable and interesting read. If that's something, you know, if this sounds interesting to you, feel free to click on the link in the description. Like I said, it's an affiliate link. Um, I think I'll continue to do these reviews. I don't intend to be this negative all the time, but uh, I literally just finished it a little while ago, and kind of these thoughts are running through my brain, and I was trying to capture, you know, capture capture them. Um, but uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Let me know what your thoughts are in, you know, in the comments. Uh, let me know if you have a different take on the book. Um, but uh, I'm going to leave it there. So uh, until next time, guys, uh, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you very much for watching. And until next time, I'm out.